So my name is David Kloster. I am with the Cyber Infrastructure for Digital Humanities. Uh, we usually just shorten that, shorten that to CyberDH, um, and that is part of Research Technologies, which is part of UITS. So there's a whole chain there. Um, my colleague and my uh, my boss, Tassie Gennady, was going to be here, but she's not feeling well. She may pop in um, online, and there is the possibility that she could then be a booming voice that comes into the room if she has something to interject. So uh, don't be scared or shocked if that happens. <laughs> so, um, but she is she may be watching from at home. So um, so yeah, so we get started. Maybe. Did I do something? There we go. All right. So if you're wanting to follow along, these are the links that you're going to need. Uh, the first one is if you do not already have a Carbonate account, and Carbonate is the supercomputer, one of the supercomputers here at IU, uh, but it's the one that you need in order to access a research desktop. So that is the link to it. It'll give you instructions and directions on how to go ahead and sign up for that. Um, and then you will also need to access Research Desktop. You'll need to install what we call the FinLink client. Uh, and basically it's gonna be, end up being a little um, icon on your computer that you just double click and then it will bring you to a little sign in screen and, and it will open up Research Desktop which will look just like a desktop that you're used to. Um, it is a Linux one, so it might be a little different if you're used to um, other ones, but it'll be familiar enough. Uh, and if you want to access the slides, that is the bottom link right there. Uh, and that way you can even match the slides to this very presentation right now. So if you're wanting to follow along on your computer and be able to just click on these links instead of having to write them down, um, you can go to that one link there and download this presentation and then when you come to those links, you can just click on them. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, we do have a few more of these coming up. Uh, so as you can see today, introduction to topic modeling. If you weren't here last week, we did our introduction to text analysis. Uh, if you are interested in that and didn't know that was that it happened last week, we're more than willing to talk to you about that too. Uh, and then next week is introduction to sentiment analysis. A uh, week after that is introduction to document simul similarity, which document similarity and topic modeling are going to be somewhat related, and we're going to actually talk a little bit today about uh, one of the um, algorithms that, and topic modeling that we're going to actually be using for the document similarity. So, um, so there is more to come if this is not enough topic modeling for you. Uh, and then after that, if you have a project or just a question or something you really wanted some help with, we're going to have our hands-on text extravaganza. So you can bring in your problems, your projects, your whatever you're wanting to talk to us about, and we're not presenting anything. We're just going to be here to answer questions and sit with you at your laptop and work through things with you and help you figure stuff out. So, uh, and that is on the John Valentine's Day. So. Um, then after that, uh, we're going to be going into, um, as, as part of what CyberDH does, we do, we do text analysis, but we also do um, 3D pho photogrammetry. So that's going to be the, after the 14th, that's going to be what we dive into then is um, 3D modeling, virtual reality, and that kind of thing, and how um, we can help you with any kind of projects or interests you might have there. So. Um, but you can see the schedule right there. Um, and so they go almost every week, same time, same place, same day, Thursdays, four o'clock in here uh, until the 11th of April. So, and obviously not on spring break either. So don't come because we won't be here. All right, so our outline for today, first we're gonna pregame, which is I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of those links and how to get yourself set up so you can get one, get access to research desktop, and then get uh, the data you need to actually follow along using a Jupyter notebook to do some uh, some topic modeling. So um, after that, we're gonna then go into a little bit more detail about what is topic modeling exactly. 
Um, part of the reason we're doing the game first is because some of the stuff that you bring over, it takes a little bit of time for it to load off of box onto research desktop. So that way, while things are loading and things are downloading and all that and uploading about some of this, um, go into more of the details of what topic modeling is and what we're actually going to be doing. So, um, so let's pregame. All right. So first, again, so this is a image of what research desktop looks like. Uh, so as you can see, it just looks like a desktop, um, which is really nice because you now have access to the Carbonate supercomputer through an uh, interface that most people recognize and can use, um, which is really nice. Um, prior to this, we had Karst desktop, and prior to that, you had to use a command line, I believe, to actually access the supercomputers. So this makes it a lot easier. Um, people that might not be as familiar or comfortable with command line uh, to still be able to utilize these supercomputers to do um, some really neat, interesting things. So, um, but again, ThinLink client to access. Uh, there's a link right there on that slide if you downloaded them already. And if I'm going too fast, just raise your hand uh, to, I can wait for a second or two, so. Um, and the nice thing too about the desktop is it has both Jupyter Notebook and R Studio. Um, today we're just going to be doing Python. We're not doing any R, so because uh, the LDA uh, topic modeling notebook that we have is only in Python. So, um, but there are other tools and stuff that we have that are in, that we have both. So if you're comfortable with one over the other, um, that's fine. We can do either one. So. So Jupyter notebooks look like this. Okay. Um, how many of you are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks? Have you used them before? Okay. So we have about three. So it's about, about half the room. Okay. So half do, half don't. Okay. So one of the nice things is uh, it's basically just a way for you to run code, um, something that they call an IDE, uh, but it's much nicer. It's fancier and it can also run multiple languages. Um, so you can actually run R or Python in here. So that's why we have a picture of you can see the little Python snake there, R there, and it'll run either one um, on Research Desktop. If you do it on your own computer, you have to actually download an R kernel and you have to download any other kinds of kernels for any other languages. Uh, Python comes built in because it was originally intended. It was actually initially called an IPython notebook. And so they've kind of changed it and updated it and allowed it to be used for, for other languages too. So. Um, it allows for detailed annotation of the code, which as you can see right here um, in the Python one I'm pointing at here, for those of you who might be following online. Um, I've gone through and named all of these things down here and tell you what they do. And then as you go down each block of code, there's, a, there's an explanation and a description of what it's doing. It's letting you know where you may want to make changes. It's also letting you know where you want to just leave it alone and don't touch it because all you're going to do is break things. So. Um, but it helps so that people who are new to programming can kind of go through and still have an idea of what to do and how to change things and, and still be able to use these. So, um, so it's great for teaching for that reason, uh, but it's sophisticated enough for experienced coders as well. So um, it's kind of the best of both worlds. So Python, which we're going to be using today, uh, was actually created by Guido von Rossum and was first released in 1991, so it's been around for a while. It's actually on its third iteration, so it's Python 3.7 now, I believe, is the most recent. Um, so it's, it's, it's evolved. Uh, it's actually named after Monty Python, the Flying Circus, not the snake, even though they keep using the snake for the emblems and everything that has to do with Python tends to have a snake around it. Um, but I actually like that it was Monty Python a lot better. So you might see another Monty Python slide later on. Um, it's beginner friendly. Uh, Python reads almost like English. Um, so when you look at the code, if you've never coded before, and I found this to be true when I, I'd never used Python before, when I first went in, I was able to look at it and have some idea of what might be happening. Um, because it kind of just says, hey, for the range of the length of this thing, you know, print that out. So I look at it and go, oh, it's going to print out this nice long list of things for me. Um, and so that was very helpful. So if you're just getting into coding, 
I actually recommend sticking with Python for that reason. Um, it's versatile. It can be used for text analysis, topic modeling, data mining, and visualization, machine learning. Uh, and they, people use it for all of these things. So uh, just because it's beginner friendly doesn't mean that it can't do things that other languages can. Um, and it, use of packages. Uh, packages basically something somebody decided, hey, it would be really nice if it was a lot easier to, to do some um, data mining. So they create a package that has a whole bunch of code that gives you functions, which is usually just like a one or two word phrase that you can put in front of your text and it will automatically do that thing instead of you having to go through and write all of the code that that little word means. Um, and so when you download these packages, uh, it just makes the use of it much easier, much more extensible, so you can do a lot more. Um, so how many of you would like to have access? He said, a few of you are following along, some of you are not, so who would need access to our data sets and all that? Because we can make you um, collaborators on there. Okay, so, and when you guys signed in, did you guys fill in an email? address okay um, Katie would you possibly be able to go in okay so in a little bit you should be getting an invite to be a collaborator um, on this folder um, so yeah those of you who want to make sure Katie knows your uh, your are you email address uh, she's sitting right behind you Katie say hi And if some of you were here last week and were following along, it's the same link. There's just a new folder. So if you've already done this, you're already a collaborator, so don't worry. You're good. Um, and you'll just have to bring over a completely different folder now with some new new stuff in it. So um, It is under text analysis repo, and then within that under text analysis. And it's that text analysis all bunched together that they have access to. Okay. Any questions so far? Those of you following along, doing doing okay? No way she's downloading anything yet? Okay. So let's jump to the FinLink client. Um, how many of you have it downloaded and ready to go? Okay. Yeah, everybody's good? All right. So it's gonna, you're gonna click on that. It's gonna, that's what the icon looks like. Um, if you're on a Mac, it usually gets downloaded into your apps folder, I believe. And if you're on a PC, I'm not entirely sure, honestly. Okay, it goes to your downloads folder then. Okay, so. And then you can decide to you know, pin it to your start or your taskbar or whatever. Um, when you click on it, you're going to get this. If you've never used it before, the first thing you want to do is actually go into your options and you're going to want to change some things around in there. Um, you're going to go to the uh, screen and you want to make sure there should be two boxes below and they will have check marks. You want them to be unchecked. And then the radio button, you want it to be your current monitor. You don't want it to be, I believe, the, I, think, I think the default is all monitors, but you want it to change to your current. And then when you're done, you're going to make sure you type in that server right there, red.uits.iu.edu, to access research desktop. And then you'll need to type in your IU username not mine. If you type that in, you're going to have trouble because I'm not giving you my passphrase. And then the password is actually your IU passphrase. Okay. How long have you had your Carbonate account? It might just be that because it, it take what, about 20 minutes sometimes? Get 
to actually get access to it. So, yeah, they'll send you an email when it's good. So, um, so, and then when you do too, you're going to have to use your duo. So if you have one of those little clickers or if it gets pushed to your phone, make sure you have that handy. And you, I just type one, hit enter, sends it to my phone. Uh, if you prefer a phone call or a text message with a, it gives you a passcode, you can do it that route too. Um, everybody good? Okay. So once you get on Research Desktop, you're going to want to go this picture on the left for those online is going to be the applications in the top left. You're going to go down to storage, box setup. Double click on that and you're going to have to, initially for the very first time you do it, you're going to have to sign into box uh, using again, your IE username and passphrase. But once you do it one time, all you're going to have to do every time you come on is go and do box setup. And when you double click it, it will mount it to your uh, research desktop. You'll have to do it every time, but you won't have to sign into box again. It'll, all, it'll keep that information. So, um, so then it's a much quicker process after that. And then it'll pop up. Usually your box folder will pop up on the desktop somewhere. You'll get a nice little folder that says box. And then you should have access to your, your box account, which now once you've had um, permission to access our text analysis folder, you should see that folder in your collection of box items. So, so you're going to move this folder, this one, intro, topic modeling. If you move any of the others, things will not work for you. So move the intro, topic modeling, and move it into your Carbonate Home folder, which is actually this one right here where it says close that as home on mine. It's going to have your username home on your desktop. You can just drag it and drop it right into that folder and you'll be good. So we're taking this folder and putting it in that folder. Everybody good? Again, if I'm going too fast, Raise your hand and tell me to slow down a minute. I don't want to lose anybody. Okay. Okay, yeah. Good, Good to be a collaborator. No, okay. Oh, right, right. Um, so you should just go into under cyber DH. Here, like I just typed in the address and it went right there. Uh, and it's not. So see why, and it might. On the other thing, if you're noticing that you're by the seat and not C, because we lowercased the CH, and this actually puts it in order of capitalized folders and things. Come first. Medical order that are all capitalized. Another section of things that are all in order that are lowercase. Um, so now that we have our intro topic modeling folder, we're going to download Mallet, which is a topic modeling tool, and our Python code is one of the only ones that actually uses a mallet wrapper so that you can use mallet topic modeling tool. So it's actually the Gens uh, Gen Gensum package in Python has a mallet wrapper. And it's the only one I'm aware of that does. So you're going to open Firefox first and you're going to go to this link right here. mallet.cs.umass.edu slash download.php. And you're going to download the zip, the dot zip, not the dot tar dot gz. The only reason is in my testing, I had some issues with that one opening on Research Desktop, and it, I didn't bother to get any deeper into why. It might have been something I did. 
but since the zip opened just fine, we're going to go with the zip and not try to eliminate any problems that may arise. And then you're going to choose save file, not, not open the, with the archive manager. We want to save it. And you want to save it in your carbonate home directory. So again, that one that has your username, home directory. Um, so just make sure though that uh, when sometimes a pop-up window will open. And in that it should have the carbonate directory right there. For some of you, it might be your downloads folder. That's fine. Then you're just gonna have to move that zip file from the downloads to the carbonate home directory once you've got it loaded. Because in testing this, everybody had different experiences. It just went straight to download when they hit save file. Other people gave them an option of which folder they wanted to put it in. So my guess is it has something to do with the settings that you have on Firefox. We're not gonna go into how you have your settings, but you get an option, put it in carbonate. If you don't, and it just puts it in downloads, then just move it from the downloads folder on research to the carbonate phone. And this is just because in our script, there's a section where we have to point to the mallet package. And it's set up already to point to that location. So it just gives you less that you have to adjust when we start uh, messing with the, the code. So once you have it there in your home, the carbonate home, you're just gonna double click, It'll look like that, big box, mallet dash 2.0.8.zip. When you double click on it, you're gonna get this window in the middle here. You're gonna highlight it and hit extract. And then when you get over here, just make sure that you see that little house in front of your carbonate so that you're in, you know, you're in the right folder and then just gonna click extract on the bottom there. And now you should have both the zip file and then just your mallet folder in the home directory. Everybody good? Okay. So now we're gonna open Jupyter Notebook. So for me, I pinned it to the desktop, so that's why it was right there. Some of you might have noticed it wasn't there for you. So to find it, you just go to Applications in the corner, Analytics, and then Jupyter Notebook is the first one there. And you can right click also and pin it to your desktop if you want. Um, I just do it because I use it all the time. So it's just right there and it's faster. Um, but if you just want to click on it for now and you should then get this and it'll have your um, carbon at home directory list of folders and files that you have in there right now when you open it. Everybody good now? Okay. So, and now for something completely different. I told you he was coming back, right? So now we're gonna go into a little bit before we start testing our, our script and our notebook, a little bit about what is topic modeling. So topic modeling, topic models provide a simple way to analyze large volumes of unlabeled text. A topic consists of a cluster of words that frequently occur together using contextual clues Models can connect words with similar meanings and distinguish between uses of words with multiple meanings. So basically, it looks at words that may be spelled the same but mean different things, and it also looks at words that are spelled completely differently but are synonyms of, one each, of each other, and it figures out that they belong together somehow based on the words that kind of occur around them, and they put them then together in a topic that these words tend to occur together. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, statistics and math and probability and things like that going on in the background. Um, and the one we're going to use is actually called latent derelict um, allocation. Yeah. Um, so we just call it LDA for short. So, but that is the uh, type of topic modeling we're going to be doing today. But, so topic modeling, what is it good for? Well, here's a good example. So this is actually a word cloud topic model. So as you can see, we have what um, Cassie likes to call her man cloud. Is, well, it's a pretty prevalent topic. Then you have what looks to be more of a familial father kind of relationship cloud. And then we have night and sleep.
sleep and things to do with the nocturnal. So, um, but one of the things that we notice in here too, um, as Tassel pointed out too, is there's, you know, where are the women? Where's the gender equality? It's missing. Um, in the father one, at least you have daughter that's pretty prevalent. Um, but in the man one, you notice that the only remotely word for female is witch. W-I-T-C-H. So, and this is from, I don't know if we specify, this is from Shakespeare's play, plays. So this is a topic model of Shakespeare's plays. And you can see which. So Tassie then had the idea of, well, maybe, you know, it's just a early modern spelling. You know, English wasn't very standardized. Um, I believe Shakespeare even spelled his name differently, um, different times that he wrote it. So he didn't even quite have a sense of how he wanted to spell his own name. So she went and looked and used something called in context. Or we're just looking for the word which we want to see. Well, maybe it's like W-I-C-H. It's just, you know, a misspelling of it. But it's not. So we know now that that's how men, when men are talking about women in Shakespeare, this is kind of how they're referring to them, right? Very derogatory, very negative. And this was something that topic modeling helped us discover. So what is topic modeling good for? Topic modeling is especially useful when dealing with a large corpus. So people like to use it when you have a thousand documents and there's no way you're gonna read all of those. At least, you know, not in any amount of time that is gonna be helpful. But if you run those thousand documents through a topic modeler, it can start to pull out some of those topics for you. And the nice thing is a lot of these packages then too will help you match up what topics are most prevalent in which documents. So if you're looking for a specific topic, a specific theme or area of discourse that you're wanting to research, you can now narrow those thousand documents down to the ones that actually talk about the thing you're interested in the most. Um, it can also be used on smaller, corp uh, smaller corpus, but there has to be homogeneity in the word usage. So this is why sometimes you have issues with um, using this on like social media and Twitter because people might spell hate H-A-T-E and somebody else might spell it H-8. And so most of these talk models are gonna look at those as two different terms. They may group them together still because they'll see the words used around it and see some similarity there. Um, but if it's smaller, it doesn't have as much to go on. So the more it has to compare to other things and see how things are tending to be used throughout, the better. So the larger the corpus, usually the better. You can do it on a smaller one, but as long you want the words to kind of be spelled the same and have the same kinds of meaning and context in order to help it. Um, it can be used to weed out certain documents or highlight others, as I discussed, and can be used to show trends in topics over time. So there are people that like to look at, okay, here's topics, but I'm interested in the topics as in a certain author or a certain um, genre maybe. So looking at um, detective fiction, you know, along the lines of Edgar Allan Poe or something in the 1800s. But I want to see throughout the entire 1800s if topics and how they talked about this and the kinds of mysteries that they wrote about, you know, changed over time. Um, and that's something you can do. So I told you we're going to talk about some al different algorithms. So, um, and I tried to go in order of when they kind of first appeared. So LSA was one of the first ones. Um, it's a theory or method. It stands for latent semantic analysis. And it's a theory method used to extract contextual usage and meaning of words using statistical computation, which is applied to a large corpus. And it uses something called single value decomposition to condense what it, we call a term document matrix. So a term document matrix sounds really technical, but really it's just uh, almost looks like an Excel spreadsheet. One side is the terms, the top is the documents, and then it just has the count of how many times each term appears in each document. And that's a term document matrix. And so part of what LSA does is, again, it uses some statistical computation, and it kind of smushes that down a bit. So it finds words that 
kind of go together and kind of globs them together and makes it a bit smaller. And um, the problem again then is that you might lose some specific words that you maybe you were interested in, but as far as then getting topics out of it, um, it can be really useful. Uh, we also is this is the one we're going to be using in a couple weeks when we do our um, document similarity uh, workshop, and that's because what's really good at is it will compare a document to another one, and it can give you a cosine similarity score, which is basically just telling you how similar are these documents to one another, which is actually very useful when you're looking at. Um, well, we've been using it on things from. Uh, Documents from the um, uh, Spanish-American War and the, or the, actually the Cuban War for Independence, um, and it's these different political parties, and some of their writings and their meetings and things like that, and you start to see the documents that are similar tell you that okay, this was an issue here, but then three years later in this document it became an issue again. You know, they're talking about similar things because these documents are matching up with each other. Um, probabilistic latent semantic analysis is just taking this, instead of using SVD, it's using probabilities and the probabilistic method. Uh, so you're getting a step closer to LDA is what's happening here. So it's just using a different method of getting this, the, the word similarities and the, the topics. Um, and then we get to latent Dirichlet allocation. So we're just going to call it LDA because I'm sure I am mispronouncing that middle word. And it's identical to the probabilistic latent semantic analysis, except that in LDA, the topic distribution is assumed to have a sparse prior. Don't worry about that. We're not going to get into all that nitty gritty and the math that happens behind it. But um, basically, in practice, it results in a better ambiguation of words and a more precise assignment of documents to topics. And then, Word embedding models, or WEMs, actually kind of, they're lumped in with these topic models, but they kind of do the opposite. Um, they actually try to ignore information about the documents and are focusing more on relationships between the words themselves. So it's not so much the document, but it's looking at word usage and what words tend to appear around it, and then you try to find other words that are used in a similar manner. So a very quick example, um, this is Voyant. How many of you are familiar with Voyant? Have used it before? Okay. Um, they actually do have, um, as you can see, a topic modeling tool. So you can, and these are just the words. Um, the fun thing we're gonna do today is we're actually using uh, the scripts from Star Trek The Next Generation. We removed all the speaker names and stage directions and all that, so it's just the spoken lines. And we're going to go, and our topic model is going to actually be of that. But I plugged it into here. So you can see Starfleet, Energy, Damned, Just, Meeting, William, Personal, Crusher. Um, and then it gives you where this topic, which document is most prevalent, or that topic is most prevalent in. So it's kind of spiking, and you can see which documents actually contain uh, most of that. Uh, so you're going to be basically seeing which episodes contain that topic. Um, but if you're interested in Voyant and something, you just want to be able to plug something you have in real quick and kind of see what you have, uh, voyant-tools.org. Um, and if we have time at the end, I can go back to this and we can we can try it out as well. So um, the one thing, though, is with topic modeling, you want to be able to do what they call set your seed, which is that way it's reproducible because since... Uh, LDA is random, and topic modeling is kind of random. It's a bag of words, just kind of throwing words into a bag and just goes through it again and again and again until it has what it thinks probabilistically is words that tend to be happening around each other. Um, if you don't set your seed, you're going to get slightly different topics each time. So by setting the seed, you're saying stop here, and each time it should be at about the same place. So this is so it's reproducible. So if you're up presenting, you did some topic modeling. You want other people to be able to reproduce what you've done. You need to be able to set set the seed. So, so we're gonna make topic models. So read. I gave you that paper. Let's read that real quick. Everybody, I'm gonna read it. And if you're following along at home or remotely.
remotely, then you can go to this link here. So where I got, got from, it's a speech. I figured since we celebrated Martin Luther King this week, that it would be fitting to read a very short. A lot of his speeches are much longer. This was a very short one. He gave it to junior hires, you know, short attention span. So we kept it, kept it short and sweet. All right, is everybody done? Okay, now this is the part where everybody's gonna probably be a little upset because we're gonna all come up here, which is interactive now. And what we're gonna do, what words are used? Okay, so we're gonna act like we're the computer and we are topic modeling this, this speech. So I want everybody to come up here and there's post-it notes and pens and just the words. Don't, don't think about topics yet, just think about the words that are used in there, which except for stop words, which are gonna be like the, of, and, let's leave those out because normally we take those out anyway. Um, and let's come up, everybody. Come on, don't be shy, don't be shy, thank you. We got lots of pens, we have lots of different colored post-it notes if you have a favorite color. Uh, if you're following along at home, not yet, no, all right. Um, try and do the same, you don't have to use post-it notes, but. So just write some words down. Okay, we're just gonna take a couple minutes that were in the speech, words that popped out at you. Um, how many of us do we have? Let's see if everybody can come up with like five, five, five good words. Um, one note or five um, write one word per sticky note. So take a sticky note, write a word, take it off, write another word, because we're going to group them together in a bit. We're, we're going to start creating topic. Five words on five different sticky notes, yeah. So just one word per, per sticky note. I know it's... Hmm. Um, Stop words like the, and, of, just don't. I, uh, you, yeah, don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't include those either. So you're looking for substantive words, words that are, that are going to add meaning. So imagine you're a historian or something and you're looking at his, at uh, Martin Luther King's speeches and you're wanting to topic model. Think of what words would actually be important to know, to, to have pop out in a topic model. So those are the words, because like I said, normally we'll have pre-cleaned um, this speech and removed all of that. Um, usually we lowercase all the words too, so that everything is even. Yeah, yeah just put them right up here, yeah. When you're done, just we're gonna collect them all right here. I know I said to stick them on the glass, but we'll just do it on the table. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean on the TV. I was running out from the side. I was. I wouldn't touch that. <laughs> yeah, no. Chris never talked to me again. <laughs> All right. That we have okay so now don't don't all get comfortable yet because you're gonna have to help me here too again so we've got our words right now do I have all the colors there we go okay. now we have our words so we're gonna look everybody's gonna come up here now and look at the words we have okay and what we're gonna do now is now we have words, let's try and form some topics. What words seem to go together to form a topic? What well, we should we name the topics then after that? So we're gonna look at these words and you might see that some of them are, we have more than one of the same word. 
But that's okay, because in a topic model, that happens a lot, actually. You'll have a word, but it actually, because it's used in different contexts in a document, right? A document usually, or a book even, has multiple topics throughout. And so, but they'll use that same word in both when talking about them. So it's fine that we have, have that. So everybody, why don't we come back up? We're going to read through, okay? And we're going to try and uh, first, because one of the things you usually do when you first do a topic model is you actually set the number of topics you want. So you kind of go in and you go, okay, let's see, we're going to aim for 20 topics. And then the algorithm will actually go through the words and try to make 20 topics out of everything that it goes through. So we're going to try and do the same thing. So how many topics should we have first? What do you think? Five or five words. Sounds good. Everybody good with that? Five? Five? Okay. So let's then start breaking them into, it's perfect because we have five colors. So I'm going to do this. We're going to put one at the top of each part of this here. So we've got the purple there. And so the green will be another topic. Another bin is what we'll call it. We'll do an orange. So we'll have one color. And so you don't have to match the colors now. So we're looking at the words and deciding which ones tend to go together to form a topic. Or at least based on what we saw in the speech, which ones tended to go together in the speech. Okay. So now we have, so now we're going to grab these and move them and put them where we think they should go which ones go together so again just because there's like I know a bunch of you wrote life and don't be afraid to jump in give your opinion disagree And don't be afraid to move one from one to another. So if somebody's put it there and you say, oh, I don't know, I don't know if that belongs there really. Hmm? Where are we putting things connected together? Connected together. Things that you think thematically go together, like topic wise. What would be some words? Because what a topic model is going to do is it's going to give you 20 topics and it's going to give you a bunch of words that it thinks makes up that topic. So you're deciding what words are making up a topic. And then we're going to decide what that topic actually is. Because usually you go through then, and you're the one that adds meaning. It'll just give it a number. It'll say like topic one, topic two, topic three. And then you're the one that goes through and gives it a name. Um, that's actually a really hard part in topic modeling, because a lot of times it's just you just randomly try for something and see what happens and then you sometimes have to go through back and adjust it and try a different number of topics and see. Um, there is some some of these and the one we're going to do today actually has something where you can calculate what it calls the coherence value which is oddly enough the computer trying to determine how coherent this is going to be to a human being. So the higher the score the coherence value the more human readable and more it make will, will make it thinks computer thinks it'll make sense to at least that's the goal of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's more people, I mean, they made an algorithm, tested it, tested it, and tested it, and just found that once they got one that seemed to actually be accurate, you know, you do that, you have people read it and go, oh, yeah, this one actually was, this does make more sense. These these separation of topics. And so it'll have a step where it actually, it actually does this and tests it on multiple um, topic choices. So basically, if you, it'll try it with like two topics and six and eight and you know, all the way up to like 40 topics but it runs it on that number every time and then tells you which number had the highest coherence score and then you can decide okay well then I want that number of topics but you'll see that when we go through the, the Jupyter notebook here all right so we have Okay, so we have I, U, okay, okay, that's fine. So this one, we have fate, determination, significance, endeavor, worth, better, achieve, best. Okay, so what are we wanting to call this topic? Significance, excellence. Achievement. Achievement. Or 
aspirations. Is that good? Aspirations? Does that sound good? Yeah? Okay. This is our aspirations topic. Aspirations. I probably misspelled that. And if I did, I am sorry. Um, next one. So we have shrub. Job. Shrub. Work. Sweep. Sweep. Street. Street. Work. Job. Job. So vocation is kind of a, a vocation one. Okay. Okay, and then this, the orange, we have moment, life, say, somebodyness, plight, life, life, life. Okay, so. Um, being. Being, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, to have or to be, we're going to go with to be, yeah. All right, school, <laughs> it's all, well, edu yeah, well, education, so it's kind of education. Okay, and then want, goals, plan, blueprint, blueprint, blueprint. Okay, so we have planning, kind of a future, the future, right? Okay, future. Okay, so we have now just created, we were our own topic model. Um, so this is just a small take of kind of what the computer's kind of doing, except it doesn't know the meaning of your words. Remember, it just sees characters and knows it these characters together. I saw this before, I see it again here. So it's kind of just doing that. So when it sees blueprint over and over and over again, there's no idea what blueprint actually means, but it does know that blueprint is often used in context with goals or planning. And so it will put those together. Um, so, okay, you guys know. So, and did we think now that we've done this, and I won't make you guys get up again, but do any of these you think could have, do you think any of them could have gone into some of the other topics as well? What other words do you think could have appeared? So maybe like we have, you know, education and we only have school, but maybe we could have put life. We could have blueprint with aspirations. So, and you probably would have seen that. You would have seen these five topics and some of these words would actually be then switched around and interchanged a bit and we appear with one another. So, um, mm -hmm. you can have the same word in multiple topics. Um, because again, words are used differently. You might use the same word in a slightly different context. And so even though you're talking about, you know, he was talking about blueprint in one aspect as actually referring to architecture and construction, right? So he was actually talking about it as more of a concrete kind of thing but then he gets more abstract with it and talks about it as like a, a path to your life. So then you would see it in two different ways because it's this, you know, this thing where he's talking about vocations and this is just a tool of one vocation, you know, architecture. And, but he's also talking about it as planning ahead and what are your dreams and your goals and making sure you're the best that you can be at whatever it is you do. So. So this is one of the outputs we're going to get. And this, this isn't interactive, but the one in the notebook will be. <laughs> but we took a screenshot and put them up here. But this is actually from the entire series of Star Trek The Next Generation. And some of the topics, we, got, we did 20 topics. So we said, OK, go through, give me 20 topics. And just put words into these 20 bins that you think go together and form a topic. And as you can see, like I said, it can reuse words. So we have topic 10 here. I believe this one over here is topic seven. You have Klingon, and you have Klingon right here. Different topics, same word. But look at the words surrounding it. Father, wharf, Klingon, son, boy, mother. Uh, Kalas is like the founder of the Klingon Empire. Those of you who need to know that. Um, Alexander's wharf's son, right? So what are you seeing here? What, what is this topic? How would we describe this? Family, right? Yeah, fam familial, right? So, but then you go over here, Klingon, Lieutenant, Wharf, Commander, Honor, Council, Empire, Ship, Challenge, Starfleet, Die. This is Warrior, right? This is the Warrior Klingon. So what does this tell us? That the Klingons, they have this, you know, warrior, but they have the softer side too. Family is very important, right? 
and they they hide that a little bit, but the top of the model pulls that out from the show. You get that that there's this we're warriors, we're fighters, but our family means everything to us. So you have that that relationship there, and this is something that the top of the model is able to pull out of that script. So this is the ba the most basic thing you're going to get. When I was telling you. So you have topic five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it goes on to twenty. Um, the thing with Python is it actually starts counting at zero, so it's going to go zero to nineteen. So you still have twenty topics. It's just instead of starting at one to twenty, it goes zero to nineteen. Um, but you can see here, topic six is that one, the warrior Klingon, and then down here, topic nine, father wharf. These numbers next to them are kind of the weight of the word, how important that word is to the topic. Okay, so even though the family one, Klingon, is back here, and it's the third most important, that's still pretty, a pretty heavy weight for that. So, um, so that's what those numbers are. It's just this word is this important to this topic. And kind of helps too with the, again, using the words, the same word in multiple topics is, yeah, it might be in that topic, but it's not quite as important to it as this word was over here. So another visualization we have here, the LDA topic model visualization. So this is gonna show topic percentages in a document. So right now our document is season six, episode 17. And this is that topic 10, the family. The Klingon is you know, more the familial one with the Klingons. And it goes in order. So you can see we have um, that topic nine there. It's not topic 10, sorry, topic nine. You can see it's the biggest one. So it's the most, that topic appears the most and is the most central in season six, episode 17. So if you're really, you know, I want to see that aspect of the Klingons. I, I really love that when, when Worf is, you know, being more about family than, than, than fighting. Um, then you have a list now of the episodes you might want to go back and watch. Um, but you can do this for anything. So like I said, this is where it helps you pull out something where maybe you have a whole lot of text, okay? Or if you are interested in, you know, if you are into film and you do have access to a script or anything of that nature for a TV show series, movie or whatever, this will help you be able to go back and tell you, okay, these are the parts I need to focus on because I don't, you know, I'm not able to go through and read all these movie scripts. I can't, you know, I can't, I have a thousand of them. But now you can focus in on, okay, these movies are about this topic. These are the most prevalent now. So, okay. So we're not done yet. We're going to now go and do the, the hands-on part on research desktop. But now that you have kind of a background of what's going to be happening with the script and the notebook. So um, if you have any questions and you, or you want a consultation with us, cyberdh.u.edu, but I'll go back to that here again in a little bit at the end. But for now, let's pull up the link and I will log in. Oh, hey, it's still up there from when I did this before. Okay. So for those of you who are having trouble So and I've logged into this plenty of times, so I don't really need to go through and do the screen thing. So let's see, I have to do my duo as well. Okay. Here we go. Okay, and to save time, I already loaded the intro topic modeling package so you guys don't have to sit there and watch it load for for a while. Um, but I'm gonna go in and my Jupyter notebook's right here, but like I said before, yours go here and you can open it right there as well. But I've pinned it to my desktop so I can just double click. And I know it says it might take a minute to start, but it really doesn't take that long. Okay. And so now you can see we have a Jupyter Notebook. I will make it bigger. 
I'm going to enlarge that so everybody can actually see what I'm doing. Everybody see that okay now? Now that it's a bit bigger? Okay. So we're going to go to our intro topic modeling, notebooks, and then you're just going to click on that LDA viz mallet-py and the IPYNB file is just IPython notebook because that's again where it came from. So, And now we have our Jupyter notebook open. And you can see we're running Python, a little Python symbol, that twisty snake, and then the Python 3. So, um, so now there are two ways when you get into a, a Jupyter notebook, um, at least the two ways that I like to run the notebook. One is you can either go up and you go to cell and run all, and it'll just start, it'll just run everything. It'll go through and run everything. And sometimes that's good, but other times there are points where you may need to make changes in the code and so you actually want to go cell by cell. So to do that on your keyboard, all you do is hit shift and return at the, or enter if you're on a PC shift and see how it's going through. And so it'll highlight all of the patients, but then we get down here and we have, so these now are uh, packages. You can see there's quite a few of them in the annotations above. I explain a bit more what they actually do, but so we're importing them. So that means that they've already been installed. Okay, and we've worked with people that at UITS that are in charge of this and they've already pre-installed so that everybody has global access to them. That way we didn't have to work with you guys on installing packages. But if you ever get on here and there's a package that isn't globally available, but you want to still be able to use it, you do, you'll go to um, the terminal, which is actually on your desktop. I'll just very quickly. So, so right here is the terminal. You'll double click it, open it. And all you're gonna do is type pip, P-I-P, -P, space install, space, whatever the name of the package is. Okay, so the Jensen one, I would just do this. I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna actually hit enter, but it would look like this. And then I'm going to type dash dash user. So what this is going to do is it's going to install it, what we would call locally. So it's going to just be on my own little personal part of the research desktop there um, for me to use. So if I install something, it's not available to everybody else that comes on research desktop. It's just available to me. But that way I can still run something. So if you go in and ever want to make changes or need to download something, that would that's how you do it. We're going to close it. I'm not going to do that because it might mess with what we're doing. No. Okay. Make this big again. So, um, but for right now, this should all be ready to go. So I'm going to hit Shift Enter, and you can see this little asterisk up here in the corner. That tells you that it's thinking. It's processing what you've just done. When the number pops up like it just did, that means it's done. It's completed that that portion of the code. Okay. So this block here, you're probably not going to be making any changes, okay? Now, we can keep going through. So this part then, we have the stop words. So this is where you're going to decide. So you can see for us, we removed captain, we removed sir. And part of us, when we first ran it, captain was in every single topic. Because Captain Picard is kind of the star of the show, for the most part. Um, and then, of course, so they refer to him as captain or they say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, so captain and sir were in almost every single topic together because it was just everywhere. So it almost became like the or of because it's used so much. So then it becomes almost meaningless for our topics. So we, we remove it as a stop word. And then here is where you're going to want to make some changes. So you see this is the file path to where you saved it. Except notice that's my username right there. So the n slash u, and make sure you have that slash in front of that capital N, otherwise it won't work. So slash n slash u, and then you're gonna wanna put your username right there, okay? So 
So you're going to need to change that. Otherwise, it's going to tell you that it can't find that file. Um, here we go. Where am I at? I always lose the mouse. Okay. So then we go down, and this is going to read in. So this is telling us now we're going to the Star Trek folder, and we're reading everything that ends in dot text, which is the entire series. We have it all in one folder right there for you. So it's reading that whole thing in. And then below, this is if you have um, some people like to run this on tweets or things like that. So we have one that reads in CSV files and another JSON. Um, in Python, this little hashtag in front just means that it's what we call commenting it out. So that means now it's not going to run it. It's not going to read it. It's going to kind of skip over that part. And so down here, now you can see it's kind of, we have some of the text. You can read some of the you know, time, Mr. Data. We will be with, within transporter range in three minutes, 21 seconds. Data likes to be super accurate. And then the next, next the tokenizing is just splitting it now into individual words. So it's making each word kind of its own thing. It's making it a, a token. And it's using just the white space in between to differentiate between words. Because like I said, the computer just sees characters. So you have to kind of tell it, if there's white space on either side of it, we're going to section it off. If there's white space on either side of it, we're going to section it off. Um, but to do that first, we have to remove punctuation and all that. Otherwise, it's going to include commas and stuff like that with the words. So Now, this is something that what it's going to go through anyway, it's going to try and find bigrams and trigrams, which if you were here last week, is a kind of an n-gram. So it's any two words or three words for the trigram that appear together so often that they kind of almost have to always go together when they appear. So what this is going to do is actually add a underscore in between the words so that when we go through, it's going to actually almost look at it as one word. So you'll see some of these topics when we get down are going to have some bigrams in them as part of the topic because it's just that prevalent of a term. Uh, the two words are that use that commonly together. So we're just, these are just some functions that are going to be doing some cleaning. It's going to remove the stop words, make the bigrams and trigrams, and do something called lemmatization. So lemmatization is going to go through, look at words, and it's going to, one, tag it as whether it's a noun, an adjective, a verb, or an adverb. And so this just kind of helps, too, with, with the meaning and then the modeling of it later is it'll know, like, nouns and nouns, you know, verbs and verbs and all that kind of you know, it just helps it with the understanding of, of the document. Um, but it can also make it so that if, you know, you have run, runner, and running, it'll take it all and make it run. So if you're interested in more of the idea of something than the actual specific word. Um, but we've actually uh, turned that off. So now this is just using those functions. Um, and the function, again, is just, we created our own that basically said do this. That way we don't have to write all that code that was up there every time we want to do those things. We can just put that one word, remove stop words, and the words we want to remove them from, the thing we want to remove it from, and it does it. So of having to do uh, what was up there. So, and again, this is all just part of the math that it's doing and the things it's doing in order to be able to create it. Um, if you run, actually, on this one, if you remove this hashtag in front of the print corpus one, it's going to give you a bunch of numbers in parentheses. So it's going to have zero comma one in parentheses, and it's going to have another parentheses with like 22 comma five. And then another one, with, it's just going to keep going like that, because what it's actually done is turn the words into coordinates, into points on a graph and part of how it measures the, proc the closeness of those words is actually measuring how close they are on that graph given those points. So we cut that out because it can be kind of confusing, but, and then now we're gonna go down and actually use Mallet. So this is why you need to download Mallet first because we're actually here. And again, change this to your username and that's why we want it saved in your carbonate folder because all of this is going to be the same then. All you'll have to change is the username. 
and it should then go right into the mallet folder there and be able to pull in the information it needs to run mallet on your your top your uh, text so now we have our first few topics so you can see the card so bottom which I think it actually did normalize. It actually changed the data to datum. So the character data got um, lemmatized. And so you can see we have a link father, family, honor topic there. Now, um, and part of the reason I'm just showing you what we've already run is because notice I put here it can take a long time to run so just to save some time you guys are welcome to go through and make these changes and then, you know try and run it yourself and we can come and help if you have errors and have trouble figuring anything out but um, then we do something what's called trying to figure out a coherence score or a coherence value and so what that is, is actually in a weird way the computer is trying to determine how accurate these topics are will seem to a person. Uh, again, I'm not gonna explain the math behind it, but um, it does help you then, because it goes through and tries it on, let's say we picked five topics or six topics, then we pick eight topics, and it goes on. So we have 20 right here, 25, 35, and all the way up to 40. So it's running this coherence thing on as if we had picked those all those numbers of topics so that you can determine which one has what they would consider the highest coherence score which seems to actually luckily for us be 20 which is what we started with anyway and so then now it gives us all 20 of those topics and again it starts with zero and we'll go all the way down to 19 and we can just look at a few of them shield ship commander i mean there's you know a lot of this makes sense right star trek um, Picard, planet, doctor, lieutenant. Uh, so beam, probably from tractor beam, or beam me up. Um, leave enterprise, yeah. So we can see some of those those topics as we go. So now we have one that's going to actually find the dominant topic for each. Um, for each document. So you can see here, the, this file, so season five of point four, the dominant topic is topic 18. And that's the one that's about LaForge, computer, commander, power. So, so Jordy LaForge is probably a very prominent figure in that episode, because that is the dominant topic in that document. And we go down and we have one now that's going to actually look more at each topic and tell you which document represents that topic the best. So for topic zero, season episode 22 is the best representation of that topic. It has 37% it, it, of that episode contains topic zero. And that's shield, ship, commander, good shuttle, and you can just go down and see. So then when we go to our ones that we did, so six. So again, season four, episode 26. If you're looking for one that's about Klingons and their warlike ways. But if you're looking for, again, the one that's more about family, as we pointed out before, season six, episode 17. So again, imagine using this on your own text or your own corpus that you're interested in researching, okay, and what this can pull out for you and keep you from having to read tons and tons and tons and tons of things and actually will help you zero in a bit on certain documents or certain parts of a document that would have taken a much longer time. And so now this is going to tell us which topic is most prevalent throughout the entire corpus. So we can see the number of documents where topic zero was the dominant topic in that document. And it happens 14 times. So do we have any, so another 14, topic 15, bridge, ship, number, Riker, okay. 
So some of these kind of make, you know, it's like, well, duh, yeah, Star Trek. Um, but I was a little surprised at this one. So the next highest one looks to be 11, or actually, I guess, 12. By, but LaForge apparently is a very dominant topic. So Jordy is a lot more prevalent than I thought he was going to be. I don't remember from watching the series him coming up quite that much. And then this one is interesting because it's data. But it looks like it's about him. And those of you who watch the show know he's constantly trying to understand humans, right? Because he's an android. He wants to be human. And so this seems to be a topic about, about that, Data and his quest to understand humanity. And so now this just gives you a distribution across every um, document. So I can see all 20 topics as they relate to Season six, episode 17, and I can just go through and see how often this appears. So if you've noticed too at the end, and I should have pointed this out earlier, but at the very bottom of most of these, we have a file path that's gonna save all that these, um, what looks like Excel files. Excel, you can actually save them as CSV files in the results folder that came with the intro topic models folder. So make sure, again, you're going through, and when you see that, just change that username to yours. Otherwise, it's going to tell you it has, it's having trouble saving it because it can't find that file path. So that's going to be in most of those there. And then in this one, this is the one I showed you before. We get the output showing the topic and the prevalences. And it looks a bit nicer than that table up there, right? So a little bit easier to understand, a little bit easier to read and see which, um, and it jumps out at you, for example, you know, down like here, the other dominant topic is red, which is topic six, which makes sense, nine and six, those are both about Klingons. Um, this one, again, red, but over here we have this green one, which is topic 16. So it gives you a bit more of an instant idea of what is happening in some of these episodes. And then this is the one that is going to be most interesting to you guys. So this one is the interactive one, and it actually saves it as an HTML file. And I can show you later if you go into the results folder and you open that, um, it'll actually open in your web browser and be interactive. And you can take that then if you have a website or something like that you want to embed it in, you can do that then. And it's right there then um, for you to use and, and, and interact with. But so see how I, I go over here, I can look at the different topics and the words that appear. So what you're seeing here, each circle represents a topic and the farther away it is from the other ones, the basically if it's grouped together, they're more similar. Those topics tend to, to be more similar to one another. So 19 and 10 are very dissimilar. They're the, probably the farthest away out of this whole group from one another. 14 and 17 even, or 14 and 11. Um, the size is telling you how prevalent that topic is throughout the entire corpus. So the bigger it is, that means that that topic occurred more frequently throughout the entire collection. So you can see 16, 17, 19, um, all occurred more often than some of these other ones. Six was kind of small, didn't happen much. Which again, um, yeah. Uh, the thing you need to notice about this though too is we're going back now to counting from one to 20. So even though the topics we have above went zero to 19, um, this is gonna go one to 20. So you have to adjust the numbers a little bit. So they should only be one ahead then. So Topic zero is actually topic one. So the one we're interested in, topic six and topic nine, are going to actually be seven and ten, which is why they were that on um, the, the still image on the slide I showed you before. And so the other thing you can do here is you can highlight a word and see what other topics contain that word. And the bigger the ball gets, the more prevalent that topic, that word is in that topic. So again, we had Dr. Adam and Klingon again shows up. Romulan, Time, Warp, right? Um, 
So we go Klingon, and again, we see our 7 and our 10 from before. Um, and then this up here, real quick. Basically, what this does is the closer you get to zero, the more jargony your words are going to be. What that means is right now we're throwing in words that occurred pretty normally and um, were dispensed pretty evenly throughout the corpus. But if we move it closer, you'll actually see some of these words. If I drag it to 0.6 here, oh, actually, I need to go to, sorry, I need to do it on an actual topic here. So you see that, and then, but if I move it back, you see the word shift. So what it's doing is the closer you get to zero, it's basically words that are more, most unique to that topic are going to become more important and move further towards the top, even though they may not have occurred as frequently in that topic. So you're basically trying to say, okay, this is really unique to this topic. This really, um, I don't want to say it only occurs in that topic, but it is more important and makes that is you more unique to that topic than some of the others. All right. Are there any questions? Anybody wanting to is anybody trying to do it on their own on their laptops, having any trouble hitting any errors? And so if you see a file path, just just check it out and make sure that part that says close data has your own username. Are there any any questions about topic modeling in general, about the notebooks, about the this notebook in particular? Is still nobody online? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons we chose Mallet is because it has been fairly well vetted by like the DH community. It's actually kind of a favorite when you hear about topic modeling in digital humanities. They'll almost talk about Mallet like it's its own thing, even though it's, it's doing LDA. But um, it's one of the reasons we chose it because it's it's well known, it's trusted, that kind of thing. So, um, and some of it's going to be that you're going to need to ask questions, find out what what actually works. Some of it's just going to be testing it. Because there's some I've tested and it gives you something. You're just like, there's no way that's right. Um, and that's why we always say this caveat, when you first try something new, try it on something you know. Part of the reason we chose Star Trek is because Tassie and I watched it. I mean, I've, I've seen every episode at least three times, I think, if not more, some more than that. It just depends. But So I know it well enough to know if I got a result, I could look at it and be like, no, nah, this isn't working. So that's why you should always test first on something that you know, so that when you get the result, you can verify whether the algorithm you're using is, is accurate or not. So again, this is, it's using probabilities, so and it's not 100%. A lot of what we do, even though we're using a computer, which is very you know, specific and this is only, I only know that these four letters go together because I've seen them here and here and here. So I'm just reading those letters and that they go together. I have no idea what this word means. It doesn't know what cat means. It doesn't know what dog means. It just knows that C-A-T keeps appearing in different places. And also next to C-A-T is M-E-O-W, meow. So now I'm going to put this together because they seem to be occurring around each other. Um, part, well, that would be more like uh, machine learning, and that's kind of what that does a little bit, because usually with that you do have um, a dictionary. A lot, of, a lot of them actually pull in uh, and use that as like a test, um, or what they call a, uh, blanking on the word, yeah, a training, yeah, a training document. Um, and so that's what the machine learning is, is basically, yeah, it's trying to match it up. And part of what lemmatization is, is actually a dictionary 
and it tells it if you see these words, you know, these words are the noun form, these are the verb form, you know, this is a, this word is an adjective, and when you see it, change it to this. When you see it, change it to this, you know, so it is kind of, the lemmatization is kind of doing that a little bit, and it is, that's why I said we, we use it for that reason, it kind of helps a little bit with the, the cleaning up of the text and makes it a bit more uniform. Um, so again, otherwise, run and runner, running, if we don't do that, they're going to all be possibly put in different places, even though we might want them all in the same. So, which is again, even though they're similar words, they might be used very differently. And so the computer just knows that this one and this one are not used to, used together and the words surrounding it are not the same. So I'm going to assume that they're different. Yes. I mean, it's seven seasons, 25 episodes in a season. So it's not huge, but I mean, and that one takes a while, no matter what. Um, I think the calculation it's doing is just a bit intense. And it's remember, it's doing it over multiple topic numbers. So it's running it more than once. So it's basically taking all of those seasons, running it as if you picked eight topics. And then running all the whole series again as if you'd pick 12. And then running it all again as if you'd pick, and getting the coherent score for each time. And then giving you that score. So that's part of the reason it's taking forever is it's. I do not. <laughs> I do not, but I don't believe so. Otherwise, I imagine it would be going a lot faster. I would have to, I'd have to look at the Ginsum package and see how it actually is doing that. I mean, like the really long code behind it. So I guess my real question is, like, at what point is it closer to the margin of or question of the end reading the one or two that you consider the last reading the one? That, yeah, right. So I would say it, it really depends. Um, because I mean, if you have a whole bunch of, I mean, you might have a thousand documents, but if they're all like just four stands of poems, that's not the same as my three documents, which might be the Justinian law code, you know, that I just managed to condense into three text files. Um, so again, it's going to be, the, you know, the gigabyteage, the bytage of your text um, that's going to determine that for the most part. So, um, and I, again, it's going to depend on the your own personal laptop versus you can try running it. If it starts smoking, then you want to use, <laughs> you want to use research desktop. Um, and that was something we actually figured out just earlier this week was uh, there will be times when you might do something and be like, man, this is actually faster on my laptop than a research desktop. Um, so if it's something really small, you probably want to try and do this just on your, your laptop because part of what research desktop is doing remember is when you're running this you're actually sending it to the carbonate server and then it's computing and sending sending it back so the time it takes for it to go there do its thing and come back takes some time so when you're doing something really small your computer might actually be a little faster at least in your idea of faster like it's actually the, i think the compute time it actually is taking over in carbonate is quicker but as far as it having to do more things at once, it's going before it spits out the result, it's going to seem like it took longer than your laptop. However, um, like I said, once you get into either one, you have a whole lot of data, like said, thousands of documents that are, you know, um, we did, I going to say we did tweets, we had like 2.6 million. We had to do it on research desktop because I tried it on my laptop and came back like six hours later and it was still thinking about it. We did it on carbonate and I think it took up like 20 minutes. So that, that's where you're going to see that, um, that big difference. So if I have like 5,000 tweets, yeah, my, my computer can handle that. But the other reason you may want to use research desktop too is you can actually run something, close your computer and go to sleep wake up and then just get back on and it'll have processed it for you while you were, while you were sleeping. 
you didn't have to leave your laptop on, charged and plugged in with the light blaring and keeping you awake. Um, so that's another reason you may want to is if it's just something you're like, I just, you know, I don't need this right now, but I'd like to have it tomorrow. I'm just gonna get on research desktop. I'm gonna run it on there. I can close it, let it, because again, it's in the it's in a server, so it's not actually running it on your laptop. So you send the job in and it does it and then gives you the results. So that's another good thing with this one, with uh, with research desktop. Plus, it's just cool to say yeah, I computed this on a supercomputer. Any other questions? Um, you have a storage limit. I for, not on oh, not on box on if you keep things on research desktop, you have a storage limit. On box, you don't. So that's part of the reason that it's nice that they've added this because um, car desktop didn't have this functionality, the box setup. Uh, so that's really nice that they've done that because now I just load things up from my my laptop onto box and then I get on research desktop and just pull it. And I'm, I've got it right there. So instead of having to use a SFTP client or something like, like Cyberduck, which is what we used to use for cars, but now we just use this box. Really enlarged it with the yeah. Yeah, we, we have a whole group of people that that's part of what they do is when you have that kind of data where it's really large, um, they can help you figure out like storage and all that kind of stuff. So um, so if you have something that big, <laughs> I can talk to you afterwards and we can get you in touch with whoever um, to be helpful with that. So. Yeah. Yeah, I am not that person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what I what I get from topic modeling is that it's essentially the same thing as like just yeah what something's about. Yeah. We're good at that. What um, because, well, one thing like I said, I brought up like Justinian's law code. He was a Byzantine emperor. Uh, law code was very extensive and very large, but laws are all different and they all deal with different topics. Some, you know, might be laws against murder, others are laws against thievery. Um, this is going to help me narrow down where exactly in that those topics exist, for one thing. Um, it's going to help me know. One, another one, like I'm not going to go through and read all that. I mean, there are laws. I have some idea of what's in there, but certain topics might still be more prevalent. You might find more laws about a certain thing. Um, uh, for example, when people have compared like the law code of Hammurabi, um, the Babylonian ruler, with um, the Mosaic law code, they actually found differences in that Hammurabi's law code dealt more with property. You got punished more severely when you stole stuff and damage people's things than if you killed somebody. Whereas the Mosaic Law was more with things like when you hurt a person, when you were more inclined to actually like hit somebody or assault someone or do something horrible to that person, then the punishments were more severe. So you saw, but you might not get that right away. I mean, we have, because those have been around for so long that people have, you know, perused them and you get degrees in, in some of these things that, yeah. Um, but something like I said, that's extensive like Justine's law code. And part of it is that the Mosaic law and Hammurabi's law code are much shorter and not as intense as Justinian. So when you get a large corpus like that, um, or if it's something that you're new to, um, where maybe it's still within, I mean, you know, I study medieval history, that's where my background is. Um, but that in the Middle Ages cover about a thousand years in an entire world. I don't know everything that happened in the entire world in that thousand year span. So even though it might fall within my broad umbrella of medieval history, I might end up researching something that isn't, you know, my specific focus was on the Crusades. But if I get into, you 
know, Eastern European medieval history, um, I'm going to need some help and something like this might be able to help me. Yeah. Right. Um, and most of what you're going to do in digital humanities, this is going to be one tool of many that you're going to use. It's going to help give you insight into parts of your text and your corpus, uh, but you may need to use other tools later um, and most likely will. It's very rare in my experience when you're doing a full on research project where you're trying to really, you know, get something, you're writing a book or an article, but you're using these tools to, to help you just glean more information from the text, to help you, like I said, narrow things down, help you um, maybe find relationships that humans miss because some things aren't human parsable. It's just too much, right? Um, or it's honestly just something that because of the way our brains work, we don't see it the same way a computer does. And when a computer puts something together, it's kind of a aha moment. Um, an example is uh, they were clustering Shakespeare's plays and Othello, which is a tragedy, was grouped with the comedies when it was run through a computer. Humans hadn't thought of that. We just, you know, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But because of the way the linguistic style in Othello worked, um, it actually had very similar style to Shakespeare's comedies. So that was kind of an interesting, and again, that was something a computer found that most people had kind of, you know, just taken it for granted. But so it can help with things like that too. Sometimes you do get those things where the computer spits something out and you're just like, that's really interesting. I would have never done, you know, I wouldn't have done that because as a human, you miss things or you see things, you just see things differently. So, any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Yeah, um, I was hoping when you guys are following along, you were welcome to change this up. And I mean, you have access to it now on Research Desktop, so go ahead and go in if you want to try it sometime on your own. Um, but the, let me go back to the slide deck. And, uh, well, let's close this out. Okay. I'll go back up to the, um, there we go. so the hands-on text extravaganza, that's going to be, we're not presenting anything. We're just going to be sitting here waiting for you to come in and we can go over any of these other ones. If you've come to all of them and one of these sparked your interest more than the others and you have a project you think might work for it, or if you're just wanting somebody to be like, hey, I, I have no idea, but this seems really cool, and I just like to know how to use it in case I have a project in the future. Um, doesn't matter. Just come in. We'll be here uh, same time again. We'll be here at four o'clock. Um, and then like I said next week is introduction to sentiment analysis, which is basically looking at. We're going to be looking mostly at social media for this one, but you can use it on regular text as well. And it's kind of telling you how positive, negative, neutral the language is um, in there. So. Are they talking positively, negatively, or kind of just, you know, feelings one way or the other about in the, the text that you're, you're looking at, which again, we've used mostly on Twitter, but, um, and then the other one, like I said, introduction to document similarity, that's going to be where we talk about LSA. That's what we're going to be doing there. So LSA does much more of a document to document comparison. Um, of the word usage within each document and gives you similarity of the documents to one another. Which again, form of topic modeling because that just tells you the topics then in those documents are probably the same or close to it. Anything else? All right. Um, as I said before, if you do have something, you know, you leave here and you're like, you know what, actually I have a project I would really like some help with. Um, our email is cyberdh at iu.edu.